The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. Father, and our Lord, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, in the past week and a half or so, this community of faith has gathered a number of times to hear the lengths that God has gone through to reach out to all people. From the shepherds who were at the bottom of the social ladder in Israel, who were terrified at the presence of the angels who came to announce the good news, and yet they go and they see it for themselves. From that end of the spectrum to the wise men who were really at the top of their social ladder, even though it was a different culture and a different place, they were at the top. But nonetheless, they were outsiders to the people of Israel. They were outsiders to their faith. And yet they observe this star at its rising. They know what it means, and they methodically and sincerely follow that star, and it leads them to find this new king. Now, the wise men, there's plenty of different people that will tell you what or who they are. They're most likely what they call Zoroastrian priests, which is nothing you have to remember, other than it's a different faith. And so they were scholars. They were the learned people of their own tradition, of their own faith. And they were especially people who studied the skies, and they studied the stars. And it's just that. It's their interpretation of astronomy that led them to this king, that led them to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And we hear that in the story. We hear of people looking at astrology and, and, and basing their decisions and their direction on that. And to be honest, if we heard that any other place other than this familiar story of Epiphany, we would probably think it was a little strange. If we heard it almost anywhere else in our, in our faith or in our lives where people guided their entire lives based on astronomy, we might think that's a little strange. We would question those outsiders who might come to Jesus because of their faith or a different faith especially, but at that time it was even considered science. The practice, the interpretation of their faith is what began their journey. And so as they left their homeland first, led and guided by the light of a star. Then as they get to Jerusalem, they go to the seat of power, the authority of the region. They're given another direction. And that direction comes from the prophecy from the Old Testament, Micah, the prophet Micah, who tells them that they must go to Bethlehem. And so once again, their journey continues. This time, the star appears again and leads them to the house, to the very house and place that Jesus was. And then after their encounter, they're led home, but in this case, they're then led by a dream. 
So I have, I've heard and I've preached sermons on the significance of this day, on the significance of the wise men who show up at Jesus' doorstep, and especially the gifts that they would bring, what they meant and even what they would foretell about Jesus and his life. They represent things like his kingly state, his priesthood, even his death. And all those might very well be true, but the more I look at this story, the more I read about this story, I am convinced. Convinced that the real gift and the real power of this story is simply in their presence in it. Their presence with the Christ child is far more important, far more meaningful than any of the three gifts they came bearing or at least the three that are mentioned. And whether that visit, whether that visit took place at the manger in Bethlehem or some other place, depending on how you interpret that, it's not the most important piece of the story. Because in this story of Epiphany, we hear about the extraordinary lengths that God will go to to bring people to Jesus. We think about it for a moment. Some of the stories we've heard just in the last week or so that God came to us in human form in the birth of Jesus. That's an incredible length to begin with. The angels pointing the way to the shepherds. And now God using scholars, learned people of another faith, to come to Herod, to come to the people of Israel, the Jewish people, and announce the birth of their king, the birth of their Messiah. Outsiders announcing the birth of their own Savior. That's quite a length for God to go to. Their presence in the story, the presence of this group of people from another faith is significant because as Jesus' birth was announced, it was announced as good news for all the people. So these foreigners come to celebrate the good news that a king has been born. And God uses them not only to, to find and to visit and see this king for themselves, but to spread the news even to God's own people. Now, I have to admit, there's, there's a part of that that makes me just a little bit uncomfortable. I don't always like thinking about or portraying the wise men as scientists practicing another religion. I'd much rather them be some sort of seekers or wanderers who just happen to, to be led to the Christ child. But that's not what we have. We have this group of people who show up practicing another religion, and because they do, they show up at the feet of Jesus. And I think sometimes this is uncomfortable for me, I know, because it makes me think about how hard God reaches out to people. And it makes me remember that God's reach and God's grace and God's power are not only wondrously confusing and hard for us to understand, but sometimes wondrously frightening as well. What are the implications for us today? What are the implications that the Magi come looking for the Christ child, not through the tradition of which he came, not by the way or the belief or the, the scriptures of the Israelites? What does it mean that they didn't come because of prophecy or scripture or anything having to do with the Jewish faith and the Jewish culture. Well, we get people who walk through our doors on a regular basis for the first time. And if you've been one of those people, you know that not always do people come through our doors because of being a particular denomination or a particular tradition. They don't always come because of preaching or liturgy or sacrament or vital outreach ministry. Maybe sometimes they do. Those are all things to me that are important. And they've been important since I can remember because they've been a part of the church since I can remember. But just like the wise men came seeking after the Christ child by studying the night skies, sometimes people come into our midst studying their own night skies. They come to God, they come to faith, they come to, to congregations in different ways and for different reasons, nonetheless knowing that God is here. We're reminded this morning in this story that God's work of proclamation, God's work of good news, isn't always about the right formula for ministry or doing things in the conventional way or even within the boundaries of the church. 
It isn't always about tradition for tradition's sake. Not only should we recognize, but we should look for God to work in ways that are outside of our church box, because God has always operated that way. It's certainly what happens in our Epiphany story this morning, with the journey and the visit from the Magi. And we need to be reminded that if we only look for God in the places where we want God to be, we will undoubtedly miss out on a moment with God. It's far too easy, it's far too common for us to be skeptical or maybe even overtly hostile when God comes to us in a new or different way, kind of like Herod. When someone wants to worship God in a way that's different from us. Sunday mornings, even other days of the week, but especially Sunday mornings, people around the world gather for the same thing. They gather for one reason. Whether they do it with with bands and guitars and microphones, whether they do it with organ or piano or drums or a cappella or with no music at all, millions of Christians gather around the world in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And we worship in all kinds of ways and in all kinds of languages. But we worship the same God. We worship, nonetheless, as a Christian community around the world. In this season of Epiphany, we are are broadening our horizons, which is sometimes another eloquent way of saying we're making ourselves a little uncomfortable. It's just for a few weeks. As we sing a a few parts of our liturgy with music from, from other places, from other cultures, even in other languages. Not too many, I hope, but just enough. Just enough to make us uncomfortable, to make us think and slow down enough to know what we're doing and why we're doing it. And to remember that we're not alone in our experience of worshiping God because Christ's light has spread throughout the world. So the season of Epiphany, I invite you to think of it as an opportunity to experience God in a new way. Whether you love the music, hate the music, just kind of put up with it, experience it in a different way and look for God in the midst of it. This day and this season of Epiphany is a time for us to celebrate the light, God's light. And we need to remember that we don't control the light. We aren't the light. And I think most of the time, we don't even fully understand God's light. But in the midst of this season, and really throughout the year, we we celebrate it. We celebrate God's light. We bask in it. We try to reflect the light of Christ as best we can. And we look for it. We look for it in the world around us, in the people around us. Epiphany is described or defined as a moment of sudden revelation or insight. For us, when we think about Epiphany, it may have started that way as one moment where God was revealed to humankind, but then also spread to the world. But for us as Christians, God's light has come into our world and into our lives through Jesus Christ, so that even in a world that is filled with darkness, sometimes we're far too aware of that darkness that the earth brings, we need to remember that there is more than enough room in Christ's light for all kinds. And that Epiphany isn't about just one moment or one story, but we live in that constant state of Epiphany. We live in Christ's light, reflected for all to see. Amen.